Well, let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bogosh, an infectious disease specialist at the University Health Network. Uh, Dr. Bogosh, good to see you again. Thanks for taking time to speak with me today. Appreciate it. Um, My pleasure. Let's let's start by these uh, the, these clearly worrisome numbers, these big spikes in Ontario and the province of Quebec. Um, how surprised are you to see these kinds of numbers in Ontario? Uh, in all fairness, many people have been predicting a rise in cases in the fall and the winter months. We knew that cases were going to start to climb as people moved indoors for a variety of reasons. You know, back to school, back to work in person, colder temperatures, economies opening. There's a lot of reasons that are driving people back inside. Personally, I was a little surprised that they went up this early on in the in the year. I thought we'd be starting to see the rise in perhaps October or so, but uh, you know, we started to see this gradually start to rise in, in uh, late August, and it, uh, it continues on to this day. So we haven't really turned the corner yet, and we're still seeing this, uh, this trend, especially in Ontario and Quebec, but also in Alberta and B.C. Mm -hmm. with all the metrics headed in the wrong direction. So when you say you were a little bit surprised to, to see it this early, what does that say to you? Well, it just I think there were probably factors in these in these provinces that were driving infection, and uh, they were we knew what they were. We knew you know this this far into the epidemic, we know how this virus is transmitted, and mainly it's indoor gatherings. So be it uh, you know private parties, be it certain sectors of the economy, be it outbreaks associated with some restaurants or bars. You know, there's a lot of different factors that were driving uh, these outbreaks, and. You know, in all fairness, I think during the quieter times of the of the summer, we, we probably could have addressed uh, the smoldering cases here and there, uh, and and been a little bit more proactive in, in ensuring that there was greater public health messaging and uh, access to diagnostic mm -hmm. testing and contact tracing, really reevaluating all the fundamental pillars of an epidemic response and really optimizing these such that when we were going to get pressured with the greater cases in the fall and the winter, we'd be, be uh, better prepared. What do you think is the right course of action now uh, by governments and health experts to try and get this back under control if it can be brought back under control? Yeah, I, I think it can be brought back under control, but of course it's going to take some significant efforts. And I think I like to break it down into what we can all do. And it, we certainly have to think of this as what individuals can do. There is some individual responsibility. Of course, that's not the whole story, but we are capable of making decisions and making good decisions and, you know, avoiding certain scenarios like, you know, house parties or crowded gatherings in, in, in houses or in private parties. We've heard are a source of many outbreaks. That's just one example. But individual decision making is, is, is helpful. Of course, we have to focus on businesses and organizations. If you house people under a roof for any reason, maybe you're a business, maybe you're a school, maybe you're a library, maybe you're a condo owner, if you house people under one roof, you are responsible to ensure a safe environment, be it for your staff, for your students, for your customers, and there's a, a certain responsibility there. And then I think lastly, we have to think about what the responsibility is of the governments and the public health units. Are you setting policy to set businesses and civilians up for success? Are you optimizing your epidemic response? Have you optimized testing and tracing capacity and all these other fundamental pillars of an epidemic response? So I think we all have a job to do. And if we all do our job, we'll get through the fall and the winter okay. But if there's breakdowns in that chain, it's going to be a, a bit of a rough fall and winter, unfortunately. Let me drill down on that a little bit. So we, we, when we look at some of the measures that have been taken by government, for instance, you know, dialing back uh, bar hours and so on, uh, do you think this can be managed with those kinds of approaches, or do you think we're, we're, we should be concerned and, and considering getting back to the, uh, the sort of complete lockdown scenario we saw back at, in the first wave of this pandemic? Schools closed, businesses closed, people staying home. Are we going to get there again, do you think? It's hard to say, uh, and certainly uh, nobody, nobody wants a lockdown. We know exactly what that's like. We know how horrendous that can be economically, medically, socially, psychologically, I mean, that is damaging. And we've already been through that before. The key here is, can you intervene now with some more, I, I guess the word is targeted public health initiatives to really get these cases under control so that there doesn't have to be a lockdown? I think the answer is, yeah, sure we can. But I think it just gets harder and harder to accomplish as case numbers go up and up and up. And as you see a rise in cases, I think, unfortunately, the options to successfully manage this with targeted interventions, uh, it sadly goes down. And the probability of getting this under control with targeted interventions is just, they're just fewer and fewer 
uh, targeted interventions that will keep this under control. And you're, unfortunately, I think they'll need to use more blunt instruments uh, mm -hmm. as cases climb. But I don't think it's too late to do it. Uh, but I think we're probably getting close to some threshold. Do we need, uh, let, me, let me finish on this with the issue of information. Do we need better information from our health and political leaders about uh, the source of these new outbreaks so we can understand, you know, uh, what behavior has to be changed? Is, is it enough to p tell people to avoid social gatherings without being specific about which kinds are triggering the spread? No, that's a very good point. Uh, I have a few thoughts on that. One is that we know that any any gathering of people in an indoor setting, doesn't matter if there's two people or 20 people or 2,000 people, any gathering of people in an indoor setting, uh, you, can, you can certainly transmit this infection. So we have to really ensure that we keep indoor environments as safe as possible. The second thing is with information, um, yeah, there does, it, it's, you know, I think that answer might differ depending on where you are in the country. But when you look at what is known about many of the cases or many of the outbreaks, there's oftentimes uh, a lot of unknown information. You know, where did the person get this? Do we have uh, the highest caliber of contact tracing? And there certainly is a need for better information. And I would even say better transparency of the existing information in some, ex in some cases, not in all cases, uh, but better information and in some cases, better transparency of the existing information such that uh, public health officials can, and, and, and senior political leaders can, can make policy and also so that the general public is, is more informed about what's happening and where it's happening so that they can make better decisions for themselves. All right, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, thanks again for your time tonight. I do appreciate it. My pleasure.